Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Technologies of the Future weekly webinar with live Q&A. This morning, we are talking about lifelong leadership with a tribute to the Queen. We have had the sad news this morning that she has passed at age 96. And so we thought that it would be great to explore a little bit of a conversation around lifelong leadership with a tribute to the Queen. I am a huge fan. So this morning I actually put together a little list of just uh, from online some of her famous speeches, which actually started when she was 13. So I'm going to share the seven most memorable speeches given by Queen Elizabeth II. And... Let me just read to you a little bit about uh, those seven speeches. Queen Elizabeth II's annual Christmas address may have been the most famous, but her 21st birthday one is even more powerful. As a world leader for over 70 years, Queen Elizabeth II had to make a lot of speeches. Some of her most powerful addresses came before she even officially took the throne and continued through regular speeches on Christmas and in moments of crisis. Even just months before her death at age 96, the Queen was still speaking to the nation, reminiscing fondly about her husband, Prince Philip. Some of her most memorable, in 1947, she gave a birthday message. Though she wouldn't be Queen until 1956, Princess Elizabeth delivered a message on her 21st birthday in South Africa in which she dedicated her life to serving the British Empire. In 1997, she gave a tribute to Princess Diana. After Princess Diana's death, Queen Elizabeth honoured her daughter-in-law's unforgettable life with remarks at Buckingham Palace, even though the pair had a notoriously difficult relationship. She said, In good times and bad, she never lost her capacity to smile and laugh, nor to inspire others with warmth and kindness. Queen Elizabeth said, I admired and respected her for her energy and commitment to others, and especially for her devotion for her two boys. In 2020, she gave a, a COVID-19 broadcast. In April of 2020, she addressed live streams from Windsor Castle. Queen Elizabeth acknowledged the toll the COVID-19 pandemic had taken on the world and encouraged others to persevere. She ended the broadcast with the now iconic line, we will meet again. 1940. BBC's Children's Hour broadcast. This is probably my favourite. At just 13 years old, Princess Elizabeth delivered her first ever public speech on the radio, a morale-boosting message addressed to fellow young people affected by World War II. And when peace comes, remember it will be for us, the children of today, to make the world of tomorrow a better and happier place, she said. In 1960, the state opening of Parliament to kick off the parliamentary year, the Queen highlights priorities for the upcoming months, and Queen Elizabeth delivered a particularly rousing speech in 1960, which was also the first one filmed in colour. My armed forces will continue to make their contribution to the safeguarding of world peace, she said. The friendship which links us to our great ally, the United States of America, is a powerful element of the defence of peace. In 1957, the Christmas broadcast she delivered her first Christmas address to the UK in 1957 in what became a national tradition that has also served as a unifying event at the end of each year. She wasn't the first to broadcast a Christmas speech, but she was the first to have her speeches televised 25 years after her grandfather, King George V, appeared on radio. 25 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages, she said. Today is another landmark because television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. My own family often gather around to watch television as they are at this moment and I shall have, and this is how I shall imagine you now. I very much hope that this new medium will make Christmas message more personal and direct. It is inevitable that I should seem rather a remote figure to many of you, a successor to the kings and queens of history, someone whose face may be familiar in newspapers and films, but who never really touches your personal lives. But now, at least for a few minutes, I welcome you to the peace of my own home. And in 2021, her Christmas broadcast, in her final Christmas speech, Queen Elizabeth honoured her late husband, Prince Philip, with a heartfelt address. She said, his sense of service, intellectual curiosity and capacity to squeeze fun out of any situation were all impressible. She said, that mischievous inquiring twinkle was as bright as the, at the end as when I first set eyes on him. And with that, I shall 
invite online our panelists for this morning to talk about lifelong leadership and what the tribute to the Queen will be as we have this conversation. Welcome, Christina. I can see Brendan. I can see William. Good morning. Good day. How are you going? I'm a little sad this morning. Sad will be my one word opener. And grateful. Mm. And all a lot of other words, but I'll ask you guys for just one as well. Well, I was going to say grateful. So if you go with sad, I'm going to go with grateful. Uh, grateful for such an amazing display of dignity and respect and everything that she stood for. Brendan? Um, I, I really don't know <laughs> what to think. In some ways, it's like the end of the old times, right, which usually sparks the beginning of the good. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit sad because, like, uh, she, she was actually quite a, a nice person. She wasn't drunk with power or anything like that. So, um, you know, we've, we've had worse. Um, and uh, I suppose it's beginning to see what the, the new guard uh, brings. Um, hopefully it's better than the old one. Um, because, you know, we always want to improve, but uh, yeah, it's like, it's going to be a really hard act to follow because a lot of people do get drunk with power and then the queen, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a fan of the Republic. Right. But um, the, the whole idea is that the queen was quite dignified. Uh, she didn't stick a nose where it wasn't belonging. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the idea was as a guidance force as opposed to a, a um, misusing their power type thing. Mm. So I think it was as good because, um, you know, a lot of people liked her. Um, even people who are uh, supporting the Republic actually appreciated the Queen. Uh, maybe not as being part of the monarchy of Australia, but, but actually as a figure itself, as a human being who showed a lot of humility. Mm. William, have you got a one word opener for us? um more of a phrase i was really hoping she'd make it to 100 to be uh to be rather frank i was written for all you know the the entire way but you know when uh when it's time to go it's it's time to go i was kind of captured in shock because i was listening to npr this early this morning about uh how her health was not well and um then all of a sudden and you know it, it, it breaks that she uh she's no longer with us and i think that um you know her her impact that she's had on the on this world is absolutely tremendous, and it isn't so much as the filling new shoes or you know big shoes to be filled, but you know for the next emerging you know leader, um, you know it's it it's their turn to take that new precedent and carry the torch. Um, so grateful for having you know her influence for so many years. Yeah, let's let's talk about mindset, technology impact. To, uh, again this morning is our normal flow and I guess the mindset of what it takes to be such a dignified leader for 70 years uh, have <clears throat> you any other I guess um, examples of someone who has had lifelong leadership for 70 years I know there's you know some a lot of people that haven't lived till 96 so for me she's definitely going to be one of those people on a pedestal for a very very long time and um you know her legacy will live on forever christina 70 years oh i i i'm struggling to think of somebody who may have um led for that long uh i i think of people like maya angelou but they're they're more spiritual leaders or you know the dalai lama who's led for quite some time and i know any 70 years but but more in that spiritual realm I think we're so fast and furious cutting down leaders now. I'm not sure that we'll ever get uh, to that length of leadership. And if you go back into history, they didn't live that long. Uh, but I also find it um, uh, synchronous, unusual, something that this week um, Britain has a new monarch and a new prime minister. And so when we're talking about that new leadership moving forward, it's like, whammo, everything's changed. Um, overnight but I, I will keep continue to to go through my memory banks and see if Brendan or um or William can come up with anybody that may have led for close to 70 years I actually just um, I could, if I could jump in just quickly on on that you said everything's <clears throat> changed and you know I, I would actually um say the opposite in that 
two people have changed the, you know, the prime minister and the the queen and the rest of the team and um you know the country and the people and that's so not everything's changed it's just those two, two people have changed and um, the infrastructure and the legacy, I believe, will live on. So I'll clarify and say the energy has changed because the energy flows through. And if you have a look at some of the the shots of the people mourning and, you know, in absolute um, passionate passionate sadness, all that passion, passion does come from the, you know, to, to suffer. Uh, so I, for me, it's that energy. It's the energy shift. So we'll see where it goes. Thanks, William. Over to you. I yeah, so I was just thinking about what you had to say, or say, Christina, about you know the transformation of energy and you know thinking of a monarch that has lived for you know spent seventy time or seventy years on on Earth and you know you look at some of the world's you know greatest influences and and leaders and more often than not they don't have the opportunity to live that long but their legacy continues and so you know she had so much time here on on Earth I'm um, I'm looking forward to seeing the the legacy that uh, she continues to bring uh, long after her transition. Yeah. So, so the important thing you've noticed is not the fact that she was a long leader, long lived leader. It was the fact that the power didn't go to her head, mm. um, and she serves. Mm. She served as an inspiration for a lot of people, um, and uh, and I think that's that's the power of the good, right? Um, unfortunately, the new prime minister of England is not such a good thing. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, like that that person's a loon. Like they're really backwards thinking. Very very. Backwards. So hopefully, hopefully we get some renewal um, in the world. Um, but yeah, it's a bit, a bit sad. Um, I'm not sure how King Charles. I mean, everyone's been talking about King Charles for a very, very long time, and we'll see what happens when now that he's actually finally king. That what, what um, I suppose uh, additions he will make, and and what sort of inspiration it can. And hopefully, he lives up to the to the the bar that was set by the queen. Mm. I know he's wanted to be king for a very long time. So mm. he's had time to really gather his thoughts. And if you think about how young that Queen Elizabeth II was when she actually became the monarch, then um, she didn't have time to decide her style and how she was going to lead and what she would do. And she was just completely committed and devoted her life to it. And she learned along the way. And whereas Charles, King Charles, uh, is is he in his 70s yeah, i think he's so a, 73 i believe 73 he's had a long time to decide his style and his you know leadership has probably not been brought to light as much as it could have in those past 70 years so i guess um I, you know, yeah over to you uh, yeah lisa i was thinking about um you know one of the, the speeches that you mentioned or one of your favorite speeches that you had you know kind of getting thrown into the fire at such a young age and being put in the public, uh, you know, spotlight, you know, baptism by fire where you really get to know yourself and just kind of dive in head first. And, you know, your, your style really develops organically, you know, through that transition. And it's, it's cool to see that over time. I wonder just the grooming that needs to happen to, you know, at 13, be able to give a speech like that and devote your life and, you know, sort of, uh, you know, invite people who have children to think about their 13 year olds or when their kids were 13 and, you know, what would have had to happen before that to groom them to be such an incredible leader. And, you know, are we actually instilling values that, um, you know, kids do give speeches or that they do become leaders and that they can make choices that, you know, they're going to live or die by at such a, a young age. And, you know, how do we actually all become better leaders? I think about just normal humans and like normal humans, um, those who aren't royalty and and that have lived and had 70 years of leadership in their respective roles and whatnot. And, you know, have they been consistent in that leadership over that amount of time? I think some of the um, learnings that some of the Western nations have uh, in modern age is basically uh, individual wealth um, so they're not think people are not thinking about what their impact on other people are, right? And they're just thinking about how they can make their most money themselves. Um, and once once you got that mindset, then you don't care about other people, right? Because other people are obstacles. Um, where good leaders, uh, they don't just um, gain their own individual power. They're actually always thinking about what their impacts are, their leadership, their their guidance is having on other people. 
And I think that's the most important part that needs to be taught from a very young age in school, in the home, or everywhere else. The fact that, um, you know, it's okay to, you know, to be, you know, successful, but that your success shouldn't be at the expense of other people. It's not like the Trump, the Trumpian uh, methodology of if, if I win, someone has to lose, right? Where it should be if I win, that's okay, but it shouldn't be the fact that I make sure that you lose. We should both gain together. And that's the thing that should be put in, right? By cooperating, we, we, we can build our wealth, our success, our quality of lives all together. And I think that's the thing that needs, the message that needs to be honed in. I'm not sure if this is a good or a bad segue. Thank you, Brendan, mm -hmm. for that, to uh, start talking about technology. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, our, our digital selves, we, we have the ability to portray digital leadership now. And, you know, whereas the Queen was born into leadership, Trump was not. He utilised technology to get into leadership. And so I wonder if we could use that appropriate or inappropriate segue to talk about technology and and I'm going to kick off on a nice frame of how the legacy of the Queen is going to live on for a very, very long time because she was the first that was giving those addresses on television. And so a lot of her leadership has actually been captured digitally and, um, you know, I'm going to say little girls because I was a little girl and part of a Commonwealth country and I just absolutely adored the Queen and wanted to be a princess. And so, you know, a lot of people can actually continue to look up to the Queen and, you know, how she transitioned from a princess to a Queen and and see that journey digitally recorded. And um, so, you know, what what are your thoughts on the technology and the digital versions of us that we can create and the leadership role that that can lead? I think it's pretty remarkable, um, if I could jump in, you know, just discussing having a mechanism to go out to the masses, you know, inside of their homes. And, you know, when something's brand new for the first time, you know, there's more often than not, there's reservation, there's stress associated with it, but you really never know, you know, how you're going to feel, uh, you know, fulfill those dreams or, you know, your potential until you're kind of, you know, thrown in it. So, um, I guess the lessons that we can learn from, you know, her, you dive in head first, um, and you suss out and you, uh, figure out where you need to be and, and where you need to go. Uh, that's my biggest takeaway. I think for me, it's also, um, that she lived across so many new technologies, uh, and that they were utilizing all the technologies till the end. I mean, you know, social media, digitization, pre-recordings, iPhones, you know, there was this great use um, of, of technology as it came. I don't, I think she was, she, she went with whatever, whatever came. Just one comment about, um, I think she had, there's an innate quality in, in some leaders. I do believe leadership can be learnt and expanded and we can come into our own confidence uh, as a leader. But I think for some people, that is that could be innate as well and I think at 13 there needs to be an element of that but the fact that she then wasn't afraid to get on television and that she or that she didn't appear afraid it was all outward facing for her so I think that that embracing and for us to be able to follow her journey through that digitization um has been something quite remarkable as well you know even from Diana you know to the present day to I mean, there's not much about the royal family. We really, we don't know. And that's because of digitization. So I, I think it, it's, it's, she's watched it all. She's dealt with it all. Um, and for me, dealt with it so gracefully. Yeah. It was yeah, about the inspiration the that we, oh, sorry. Oh, you go, oh, yeah. you get, uh, I was just, just put, you know, posing the question, you know, what are the things that we can learn from her as, you know, each new digital transformation has taken place over the course of her lifetime and how can those lessons learned be applied to, uh, new technologies that emerge. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, like, um, the the thing was that the messages were generally messages of hope, and I think I think that's what's been lost in the the um, the media. I mean, it started early with the media. With general, is the fact that they know that bad news sells, right? But uh, but when you've got these professional leaders like that, uh, because they're already popular, good news also can sell. And I think that's what we need to start concentrating on, pushing those social media messages out that good things can happen, right? Uh, if we always concentrate on bad things, uh, then you create division, you create a sense of uh, hopelessness. 
uh, and you don't get people to get out there and um, you know add to the uh, to the innovation and, and things like that because people have been told you know the dumb down that you're not important you can't do anything where I suppose the, the queen was always well from my memories was the messages were always about inspiration and hope right it, you know too many politicians are out there telling about how bad the world is and what we got to do to fear right where she was like no we can be good and we can use technology to do this right so alpha alpha fold right um listen to that that guy when he speaks about what he uses artificial intelligence for it's not because he wants to be rich and famous it's not because he wants to you know make robots everywhere he wanted to solve problems that help humanity right and uh i just just we watched the ted talk it's really good he sits there and he says that they they took 30 years to map 17 percent of all the proteins right in human history right so it's 30 years 70 percent um over christmas when they did the alpha fold uh just for shits and giggles they did the whole entirety of all proteins over christmas right so um now they're going to figure out what else to put that sort of technology towards to solve these big problems right um and if you have a powerful leader talking about what's possible we can inspire a new generation of of people to actually know that things like cancer and diseases and all sorts of stuff can potentially be cured uh instead of spending money on weapons and all these other horrible things we can spend money um, on research and science and enlightenment and uh, cooperation and we can solve these big problems and i think that's where the existence of a powerful leader um, can actually make those things uh, you know happen I'm just thinking of the broadcast of those messages as well, Brendan, of, you know, hope and, and love and, and the Queen did it so well and, you know, the message did reach a lot of people. And so how do we get more than that? And you reminded me as you were talking the story of the two wolves and you've got the good wolf and the bad wolf and which one's more powerful and it's the one that you feed. And how do we continually feed the good wolf and be able to you know have more messages like that and I'd encourage everyone just to think about the messages and the rivers of information that actually flow into their life and so typically we consume about 80 percent of the same material as we did yesterday in the same style of material so you know are your is your are you feeding the good wolf or the bad wolf with messages and stories and you know I love watching TED talks and I, I love you know following the queen or even watching the tv series of, of the queen online and just being able to have that hope so um, just a little call to action for everyone to actually think about that and maybe today try and find some hope and some love and inspiration in the messages that you consume through digital media mm -hmm. Do you know, and if you think about digital as well, the reason that we all knew instantly when we woke up this morning that the Queen had passed is because of, of um, technology. Uh, and because of technology, I received a beautiful um, story that I'd love to share with readers. I did ask Sophia if she could come on this morning, but she, but she um, was driving, so that wasn't possible. One of our um, one of our faculty and dear friends, Sophia Samir, had an experience with the Queen at age four, and I'd just quickly like to read it. Uh, I presented flowers to the Queen at age four. We were in Germany and Dad was in the British Army. She was inspecting the troops and they needed a little girl to present flowers. They spent all week teaching me how to curtsy. At my moment of glory, I went up holding the flowers, curtsied and promptly fell flat on my face. The Queen leant down, picked me up and told me that was the most beautiful curtsy. And I think that story epitomises... Um, my image of Queen Elizabeth. I just thought it was so beautiful. I wanted it to share to share with you. Oh, thank you for sharing and thank you, Sophia. What a very cool experience. Mm. I am about to wrap us up because it's 9.30 and that's such a nice, beautiful story to finish on. I'm going to ask you all for a vision of the future. The question is, it's the year 2042. You've just woken up. What does lifelong leadership look like? Brendan, I love going to you first. <laughs> uh, I, I think I think I think it would be good to we could actually teach all people to be good leaders because I think everyone's got something to offer. Um, and uh, we we always think about you know our politicians and uh, people like the Queen and stuff like that. But as you know, as husbands, wives, parents, you know, children, whatever it is, we all got an example and something to share. 
uh, as an example of some level of leadership, either to our peers or to other people, of how that we can actually adapt to situations. And I think um, that really needs to be taught, that we can all be leaders, right? Maybe not, you know, like the queen or the king or whatever it is, but all ourselves, every single day, we need to actually try to embody that power of leadership um, so that we can be inspirations to others. William? Um, I kind of, you know, take back and pose the question, you know, what are the design principles that we need to, uh, or questions that we need to frame in order to have those channels for good, so to speak, um, and those communication avenues? Because, you know, Lisa, you're exactly right. You know, you consume just like your diet and you take care of your body, you're, you're basically everything that you consume. Um, and, you know, for me in, in 2042, um, I guess the, one of the things that I'm hopeful for is having those new mechanisms where we aren't being constantly being consumed by these, you know, negative sources and we have options towards the way that we kind of perceive information and or information and how we can uh, ultimately, you know, use that to have an impact um, on those around us, uh, whether they be at home or in our communities. Wow. Um, so for me, I, I would love to think that in 2042, uh, one of the prerequisites for being a leader um, or one of the things that we have innately learned is that uh, it is to lay down the ego um, and that we are outward facing leaders. What we're looking at is that we are we are looking at the betterment of everyone and knowing that we can't please everyone all the time. I think it might have been Bob Dylan that wrote that into into a song somewhere. Uh, but that we can respectfully agree to disagree. And I think you can only do that when the, the ego is, is laid flat and that everything isn't, doesn't feel like a personal attack. So outward facing leadership where we truly care about each other and that we, we have the resources or we ensure that the, we know we've got the resources, we ensure that we're using the resources for the betterment of all humanity. That's my utopian vision. For me, the year 2042, the Queen's digital legacy lives on and I'd love to think about all of the, the people who can um, be inspired by her hope and her leadership and that we're all leading with a lot more empathy and compassion and for a long time and, you know, I might wake up and, you know, have a situation on my hands and, you know, I'll think what would the Queen do and maybe we'll have a digital version of the Queen. Hopefully that's not too creepy, but, um, you know, the guidance and the principles and the way that she led is actually a lot more um, adapted by worldwide leaders and you know the king whether it's uh king charles or king william in 20 years time is um is it has adapted and it has um you know been raised by the beautiful queen and their leadership style will be very very similar and will all be uh great leaders because of their influence and with that i will say uh Long live the digital legacy of the Queen and thank you so much everyone for joining us this morning. It is a, a sad day and there's, um, you know, sad no news to wake up to. It's the gratitude, I hope, is overwhelming for everyone as we pay our tributes and say long live the digital Queen and her lovely legacy that she's leaving. So thank you, Christina. Thank you, William, for joining us. Thank you, Brendan. Thank you, Hayley, behind the scenes. And thank you, everyone who's joined us live on LinkedIn and uh, watching the recording. Have a wonderful Friday. Thanks, everyone. Happy Friday. Bye.